I once heard about a young couple who had just gotten married and the young wife was going to cook her first pot roast for her husband as it was his favorite meal. As she prepared it, she started cutting off all of the edges of the roast and he looked at her and he said, what are you doing? You're cutting off the best part. No, she said, everybody knows you always cut off the edges of the roast before you put it in the pan and cook it. It makes it taste better. And he paused for a moment. He looked at her and he said, bro, nobody does that. Nobody does that. And she said, yeah, they do. My mother and my grandmother did it my entire life. And so confused, the young man gets on the phone, calls his mother-in-law, and he said, look, we're, we're having a little bit of a discussion over here at the house, and I want to ask you a question. I'm curious, why do you cut the edges off of your roast before you cook it? And she said, well, I watched my mother do it her whole life, and for some reason, it just makes the roast taste better. Still not convinced, he gets on the phone, he calls the grandmother, and he says, look, I... We're in the middle of a discussion over here. I've never heard of this before, but is it true that cutting off the edges of the roast before you cook it makes it taste better? The grandmother said, of course not. That's ridiculous. Who told you that? And he said, well, your daughter and your granddaughter watched you do it their whole life and said that's why you did it. And she said, no, not at all. The reason I cut the edges off of the roast for all those years was because the pot that I always used to cook it was too small, and that's the only way I could make the pot roast fit in the pot. Now, I told you that to say, this scenario happens way more than we think. There's a lot that we do, or a lot of things that we inherited, or a lot of things that we have picked up for years that we do that sometimes we never really even know why we do them. We just do them because we have saw them done. And one of the places that I'm fearful that this happens too much is in the church. And with spiritual things, which is why we are going to take a deeper dive in the next two weeks into two important sacraments that the scriptures instruct us to observe as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive into communion, and next week, we're going to take a deeper dive into baptism. And so, by the way, we're going to baptize people. If you're here and you're one of those hundreds of people that have given your lives to Christ, but you have not yet been baptized, this is a great opportunity for you to sign up and go public with your faith. Or if you're here and you want to rededicate your life to Christ, this would be a great opportunity to do that as well. You can go to our website and sign up for next week in one of our three services. But today, we're going to talk about communion. Let me just tell you what a sacrament is by definition. A sacrament is a Christian rite ordained by Christ that holds deep and meaningful spiritual significance. And again today, we're going to look at a little bit deeper Now, we do this a lot because we take communion throughout the year, but we'll take five or seven or ten minutes throughout a service, and we'll kind of hit at a glancing blow why we do it. But today, I want to take a deeper dive into why we do it. The Apostle Paul knew how important it was, especially to the people that God had called him to shepherd, especially this group of people at Corinth, and so he wrote this to them about communion. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. It is an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Now there are several names for it, depending on where you come from or maybe your religious background. Some call it the Eucharist, which is a Greek word that simply means thanksgiving. Sometimes it's referred to as the Lord's Supper. I grew up in church, and that's what they called it when I was a young boy growing up in church. Sometimes it's just called what we're calling it, communion. They are all correct. None of them are wrong. But no matter which way you choose to refer it, as a believer, it is a vitally important part of our experience with Jesus Christ. The night before Jesus would be arrested and eventually crucified, he gathered together for a last meal with the 12 men that he had spent the last three years pouring his life into. Jesus chose some men that you and I probably would not have chosen. They were not men that were highly religious. They were not men that were polished around the edges. They were not men that had it all together. Some of them were real pieces of work, but he hand-selected them on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose, and they have grown together in the last three years exponentially. He has loved them through their doubts, because they had some. He has loved them through their fears. He has encouraged them through their faults and their frailty, and they have grown together like family. 
He would spend time with them and he would unpack parables and he would talk about the secrets of the kingdom of God and he was giving them insight into what his heavenly father was actually like. But now he's just hours away from the cross and whatever he wants to say to them, now is the time, this is it. And by the way, that is one of the things that has really stood out to me in such great significance when I think about communion personally, the timing of when Jesus instituted it. Think with me for a moment. What if you knew that you had an opportunity to have just one last meal with the closest people to you on this earth? What if you knew this was it? Right before your death or before your departure, this was the last meal that you were ever going to have with the people that you cared about and the people that you deeply loved. What would you do? What would you say? I'll bet whatever you said, I'll bet whatever you did, it would be well thought out and meaningful. I bet it would not be casual or cavalier. Those thoughts and actions would be full of great meaning and great significance. And so it was with Christ. And so when you think of communion in this way, it takes on a really different complexion because it's not just some religious activity that we're supposed to do because we attend church or it's not just some religious perfunctory function that we should do because we're Christians or religious people. If you think of it the way that I just described it, it becomes in a way part of our Savior's last will and testament for us. It's something that meant so much to him. It mattered so much to him that it was one of the very last things that he shared before he gave his life for us. So he gave them an illustration. He wanted to give them a visual to always remember what he was about to do for them and for all of us on the cross. And so he took a piece of bread. The Bible says he broke it in half. And he says to them, This is my body, which is about to be torn for you, which is about to be broken for you. In just a few hours, he knew that literally his body would be like that bread, that he would be stripped, that he would be tortured all night long, that he would be beaten and whipped and then eventually crucified. Not for anything he had done, not for anything that he deserved. Not for some sin that he had committed. He was sinless and he had done nothing wrong. He did it for who we were and for what we were and for what we needed him to do for us. He took a cup of wine. He held it up and he said, this is my blood. And through the shedding of it tonight, I am making a new covenant with God on your behalf. It is going to be spilled out to pay the penalty For your sins, Jesus is saying, there's nothing you're going to be able to do as a sinful human being to be able to rectify what has went wrong between you and God. And so I am going to stand vicariously and in proxy for you, and my innocent blood will be shed to make a new covenant between you and your heavenly Father so that you will be forever reunited with him. I'm going to do this for you. The old covenant is gone. A new covenant will be instituted on this night. And then he said, From this day forward, every time you come together, every time believers come together, every time Christians gather together all over this planet and eat the bread and take the wine, he said, remember me. Remember me. Now, how do we apply this? And what significance does it hold for us today thousands of years later? Well, let me just start here. The word communion actually comes from a Greek word, koinonia, Koinonia, it literally means participation or it means sharing. It literally is a compound of two old old English words, common union, communion, a common union that we have together. It is amazing to me how much power there is in shared experiences. Whenever you have a shared experience with someone, isn't it true? It transcends all other barriers that you have. You don't even have to know each other's name or have history together. All that is required to form a bond is a common shared experience. Uh, Tina and I love to go to New York City. We've been going for the last 25 years every December and uh, we'll go for a few days, and so we've, we've, we've done that for a long time, and I, I'll never forget this one year, uh, we were in New York, and we had got up that morning, we jumped a subway uh, to head down to Chelsea Market to have breakfast, and so if you've been to New York City, nine million people live in New York City, and especially at Christmas time, it is a madhouse, and so we get on the subway, obviously, we're stacked in like sardines, it's wall-to-wall people, and I just happen to look over to this guy standing next to me, and he's got on a black polo that says real tree. Now, if you don't know what real tree is it's a very popular camo pattern and when I looked over and saw real tree I just went 
you kill anything good this year? And that was it. My man said, kill anything good? Boy, let me show you something. He pulls his phone out. He's showing me an elk he killed in Colorado. I'm pulling my phone out. I'm showing him a big deer I just killed in Indiana. We're getting loud and obnoxious. We're talking about where we're going and the excitement of the hunt that's up to come. And for the next 20 minutes, man, it was like a scene out of Step Brothers. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yep. I never even got the guy's name. We got so excited, I never even asked him his name. I've never seen him before. I've never seen him since. But for 20 minutes, me and my brother just hung out together on the subway because we shared an experience. Millions of people in New York City, and me and this guy had a moment, all because we shared a love of the outdoors and hunting. This applies to everything. This applies to everything. For people in this room that have battled cancer, when you meet another cancer survivor, there's an immediate bond, isn't there? You, you share what you experienced, the fear of it, the, the pain of it, the difficulty of it, what it did to your family. If you've ever lost somebody that you deeply loved, maybe a father or mother or God forbid a child, whenever you meet someone else who has lost someone like that, there is this deep connection. It transcends every other thing that would separate or divide you. What bonds you together is that shared experience. We're all going through this unique time in history together and we share in this moment that binds us together. Shared experiences are powerful and they tie us together like nothing else. This is the power of communion, y'all. This is the power of communion. Through this act, we connect with Jesus Christ in a shared experience. We share in his death, we share in his burial, and praise be to God, we share in his resurrection. Paul said it like this, the cup we use in the Lord's Supper, when we drink from it, we are sharing in the blood of Jesus. We are, we are bound to him. We have a common union that he did it for us and we have received that blood and it covers the multitude of our sins and the bread that we break. Whenever we eat it, we are sharing in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are remembering that moment that he went to the cross and paid the price that we could never have paid. And so today, as we prepare our hearts for communion and to connect with Christ and this shared experience in communion, we do three things. I want to give you three words, and then I'm going to break them down a little bit for you. There are three things that we do in communion. We consecrate. It's a time of consecration. It's a time of commemoration, and it's a time of celebration. Consecration, commemoration, and celebration. Let's start right here. The first thing we do when we come to communion is we consecrate our hearts back to God. It is a time to turn the spotlight on in our hearts to take a hard look at our lives and our motivation to reflect on who we really are and we ask ourselves again, is, is he really the Lord over my life? Or do I just go to church because he's a good addition to my life? He's a wonderful amendment to my life, but he's certainly not over my life. Is he, am I living Colossians 1? Is he truly before all things, or is he just this side note to my life? Do I have just enough Jesus to ease my conscience, but not really change my life? It's a question that we need to ask. Paul said that we should. Watch what he said here. Examine your motives, 1 Corinthians 11. Test your heart. Come to communion reverently and with holy awe. Don't come to communion casually or cavalierly or act like it's just another religious perfunctory function that we should be doing. It should make us pause for reflection, stop and examine, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal anything in us that is not like Christ. Is there anything in my heart, Lord, that has slowly worked its way to take your place in my heart? Is there anything that I love more, that I fear more, or that I serve more, more than you? Communion provides us a time to get honest with ourselves and honest with God, like an x-ray put over our heart where we can look at all the stuff that sometimes we put up and pick up and try to cover what's really going on on the inside. And listen, I'm not, this happens to all of us, including me. All of us, including me. I read a book years ago that was published by a pastor from Oklahoma called Confessions of a Pastor. He really got raw. He really got transparent and honest. And there was this section of the book that just wrecked me because he was talking about some things in his life that had hindered his ministry, some of the lies that he had told himself about how he was involved in early in his life. And one of the things that he said 
just stop me in my tracks. I'm going to quote it. He said, I realized after all of the sermons and trying to look important and spiritual that I had become a full-time pastor, but a part-time follower of Christ. Oof. Mm. It got me right in the gut. Because I think at times I've been guilty of it. But how many of us could be in this room and say the same thing about our lives and say, I'm going to be transparent today, Pastor. I am going to turn on the searchlight. I am going to ask the Holy Spirit. And if, in all honesty, here's what I, had, I could say. I'm a full-time entrepreneur, but I'm a part-time follower of Christ. I'm a full-time businessman, but honestly, I'm a part-time follower of Christ. I'm a full-time student, but I'm a part-time follower of Christ. I'm a full-time mom, full-time dad, but really I'm a part-time follower of Christ. What do you see when you look inside your own heart? For some of us here today, I know this, there, there are going to be thousands of people that come and worship here today. And I know that in, in a church of our size, there's always somebody that's going to be here that maybe you are at the apex of your spiritual experience, and I acknowledge that. There may be people here today that you would say, man, i got to be honest with you, I've never felt closer to God in my life. I've never been more intimate with the Lord than I am right now. And for you today, communion will be an act of remembrance and rejoicing. But sitting right next to you, somebody would, might would say, if they were transparent and honest, dude, my heart is cold, I'm not nearly as close to God as I used to be, or I want to be, or I know that I should be. And for you today, communion will be an act of repentance and recommitment to God. But no matter which way this goes for each of us, communion is a time to reflect and look inward at our hearts and examine where are we truly with God. Not where people think we are, not where sometimes we want to believe we are, but Holy Spirit reveal to me where I really am with you. And as we are about to partake in communion, it's a moment to stop and reflect and say, oh God, Lord, I reconsecrate my life back to you. Secondly, we commemorate the price that Jesus paid when we take communion. Sometimes it's easy to get distant and removed from tragedy. Time has a way of causing us to forget important things. It's just the nature of it. It's not intentional. It just happens to all of us, and God knew this. Think about this. As Americans, when 9-11 happened, every one of us in this room can remember every little detail about that day, where we were, what we were doing, who we were with, and what had happened right before we heard the news. There has never been anything quite like it in my lifetime my father has always said that it was like reliving JFK being assassinated again, if you're old enough to remember that. He said it was the same feeling all over again, and I certainly can remember where I was and everything that was going on. But in all honesty, how many of us really think about it throughout the entire year? Not much, if any. Not because we don't care. Not because it doesn't matter, but because life rolls on and we get caught up like everybody taking care of our families and making a living and getting focused on other things and we forget about it. It's out of sight, out of mind. That is until September rolls around again. And as the date approaches and you begin to watch TV and they start showing the footage over and over and over again and then we remember. We relive it. All over again. That horrible day. And most importantly, we remember the humanity of it. We remember the husbands and fathers and brothers and mothers and daughters and sisters, all innocent, that were lost for no reason. And we remember why it's so important we never forget again, that we not look away from the ugliness of it. Listen, uh, if you've never been, when I was in New York, we've been to all of the memorials at 9-11, but they opened them up um, uh, over time. They didn't open them all up at the, uh, at the same time. And the last one they opened up, there is an entire section that is dedicated just to the people who jumped off of those buildings. And I'm telling you, if you've never been through it, you should, and you will never be the same after you go through it. The rest of the day, I couldn't hardly talk. It so profoundly affected me. And everything inside of me, as ugly and as horrible as it was, wanted to look away but I knew I couldn't I shouldn't I needed to see it I needed to experience it I needed to feel and they told stories of some of the people listen bro it, it's, it's life-changing this is why communion is so critical and vital for the church of Jesus Christ this is why communion is so important today because it is a pilgrimage back to the foot of the cross and it offers us a moment to remember what he did to look at the cross again in all of its unfiltered horror and brutality and agony and remember that he didn't have to do it but he did I've said this to people for years we've We've tried to make the cross something more bearable. 
We've made the cross something more beautiful. And so what we've done over the years is we've overlaid it in gold. And we fashioned it out of silver. And we paint these beautiful paintings. And we put them on the walls of our homes or businesses. Here's the truth. The real cross would make you throw up. The real cross, would, would, you would never, ever be able to get it out of your mind. The real cross would give you nightmares. That was what Jesus went through. And, and this pilgrimage is important so that we just don't look at this image of what was, but we see what he actually did and remember that he did it for me. It's been said for years that it wasn't nails that held him to the tree. It was love, bro. It was love. Because the Bible says that at any moment he could have called 12 legions of angels. At any moment he could have just said to his father, I tried. I went as far as I could. I'm not able to do this. And God would have rescued him and you and I would have just been out. But he stayed and he finished the course. And he did what he had to do because he loved you so much. Even in your broken sinful state. And that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, he died for us. What is, this is why when John is writing his gospel and he's trying to describe what this love is like. He runs out of superlatives. He's trying to give adjectives to describe what kind of unique love this could be. And finally, he gives up and he just says, what manner of love is this? That we might be called the sons of God. He said there's no way to define it. There's not a category for it. It's only the kind of love a God, a true God, could feel for broken and helpless people. Here's what Jesus knew, man. Jesus knew that not on purpose, but that life would happen to all of us. And that we would get far removed from the price and the penalty that he paid. And it would be easy to take for granted our salvation and the church of Jesus Christ and what he did. So Jesus himself in Luke 22 said he took some bread. He gave thanks to God and then he broke it in pieces. And when he gave it to the disciples, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Every time you do it, man, just remember me. Every time you do it, Remember me. Let me do it like this. At the top of your computer, in the address bar, is this little arrow in a circle. You've seen this, right? It's called the refresh button. It's provided there so that you can, uh, when the information on the screen that you have currently pulled up gets old, you can easily get a new updated page of information, the refresh button. When you hit it, it refreshes the page with current information. This is what communion is. Communion is an opportunity to hit the refresh button in our spiritual lives, but not to look at new information, but to be able to look at the old information, but in a new way. And say, I remember, Lord. I remember where I should be, and I remember where I am today, and I remember that it's not because of anything I have done, but I remember the price you paid for me. And today, I honor you again. We look inward at ourselves, we look backward at his death, but then we celebrate a risen Savior and the day that he promised to return and make all things new. <laughs> I love what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 11 to the Corinthians. Watch this. This means that every time you eat this bread, drink from this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death, but you're not going to do it forever. We're only going to do it until he comes. See, one day we're not going to have the need to remember because what we tried to remember through communion, we will stand in the reality of his presence. And we won't need to remember. We'll have the reality. <laughs> Paul is speaking to a time when we will be physically reunited with Christ. Several years ago, Tina and I stood on the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem and we overlooked what's called the Kidron Valley. Just across the valley is a wall that surrounds Jerusalem. And as you might imagine, there are entrances and exits. There's a north gate, a south gate, and a west gate. But what's closed off today is the eastern gate. They call it the Golden Gate. And the scripture says that one day when Christ returns, he's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives. It is going to split in half into two pieces. He is going to walk through that eastern gate, Jerusalem, and take his rightful place as king. See, the first time he came, he came as a humble servant but not in Revelation 19. Not when he comes back. He came back born in Nazareth. He came back from the wrong side. He came from the wrong side of the tracks. But when he comes back again, the Bible paints this picture. He's on a white horse, eyes like fire, a flaming sword proceeding out of his mouth. 
tats on both quads that say King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to walk through that eastern gate in Jerusalem, create a new kingdom full of peace and power. He's going to set all things right and make all things new. And the Bible says that we are going to be with him. <laughs> what? I know people go, what? That sounds so fantastic. I know. It sounds so unbelievable. I know. But the Bible says there's going to come a day that the world we live in now, that we mourn over, and we should. That we look and we shake our heads and we pray for, and we should. That's full of sin and pain and debauchery and hor horrific things. He's going to set it all right. He's going to make everything new. And it's going to never be that way again. He's going to purge it by fire. And he's going to set up a new kingdom. One that's reigning with righteousness and peace and joy. And all of the pain that we've known will pass away. I know it's sometimes hard to imagine. But again, Paul said when we take communion, it should serve as a reminder that one day on this side we will take our last communion. There will come a day we will take our last communion. And what we have known only to remember, we will have in the reality of His presence. Can I say this to you? This, this is something that is new for me. That something has happened in my life, as many of you know. But communion has taken on a new complexion for me as of late. And I want to say this for the people that are in the room that can relate. If you have people in your life that you've loved that deeply have gone before you and have already passed away and went to be with Christ like I lost my mother last November. It's made communion different for me now. Because now when I take communion, it's a time for me to always look forward to that time when we will be reunited with those that we love. That there will be a place. Jesus said, over here, no more dying, no more crying, no more disease, no more pain. For the former things have passed away, and I make all things new. He said, if you know me and you love me and you trust me, you're only going to say goodbye one time on this side, but you'll never be separated again. That's a fair shake. I can handle that. But I think about my mom all the time when I take communion now. That one day, I have a memory of her. But one day, I will have the reality of the presence of my mother in my life again. And if you're here and lost loved ones, that should encourage you as well. When God is on our side, what we can know is the best days are ahead of us. We actually have so much to look forward to. And I want to say this before we pray. Maybe you're here today and you haven't yet had this shared experience with Christ. Today you can and there's no better time because He loves you and He's calling you and He did it for you. See, i got to be careful here. I, wanted, I want you to know the truth. See, Paul made it clear communion is not for everybody. It should not be entered into with this casual, cavalier thing. People that have not put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ should not take communion because he said it's a dangerous thing for you to treat the body and the blood of Jesus with that type of a cavalier spirit. It is only for the people that have put their trust in Him, that have a living, loving relationship with Him. But let me say this. There is not a reason in the world why everybody in this room shouldn't take it today because He invites you to His table. No matter who you are or what you've done, He will forgive you and cleanse you and make all things new. Everybody should take communion today because if you're in this room right now and you're thinking to yourself, dude, I don't know Him like that. I don't have that personal relationship with Him. I'm going to give you a chance right now to do it. And there's not a reason in the world. See, all we can do is preach the gospel. But there is something that happens every time the gospel is preached. The Holy Spirit is moving. And He's drawing hearts and He's drawing lives. And He's doing what no man or woman could ever do through words. He's drawing hearts to Himself. And what God wants you to know is that He's seen everything that you've done. He's seen everything that you've said. And He still sent His Son to the cross anyway. And He loves you and invites you to come home. Repent of your sin. Turn and, and receive the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that only He can give. He loves you and welcomes you home today. <laughs> Jesus said, take the bread. And when you do, remember that my bro broken body has restored you. Jesus said, take the cup. And remember, when you do it, that my shed blood has redeemed 